<clears throat> Would you turn to Daniel chapter 11? We come now to the uh, fourth vision of Daniel, which we began to look at last week. A very intricate chapter, Daniel 11. 134 details, specific details about politics, war, marriages, told 200 to 300 years in advance and then lived out in the centuries between the Old and New Testament. It's unbelievable. Uh, and in fact, it literally is unbelievable for unbelievers. Even unbelieving theologians say Daniel could not be a prophecy because this is too accurate. But Jesus believed in Daniel, right? In fact, Jesus said to us to understand the message of Daniel so that we could be ready for everything that's coming on the, on the world. So Daniel 11, uh, and basically it's the fourth vision is an angel himself is talking to Daniel. He takes him and shows him details about his, his interest is in two of the kingdoms that had uh, of what became of, of the kingdom of Alexander the Great is broken up and two out of the four kingdoms is what he focuses on. The king of the north, which is Syria, and the king of the south, which is Egypt. And he shows him the agony of Israel, who is in between, not a major player, just a doormat, as these two kingdoms fight each other right over Israel, which is exactly like today political situation today. Okay, Israel is a very tiny nation, but it's um, right there in the worst possible place you could be in the world. And the interests of the West, the interests of Islam, the interests of communist world, the interest of Russia, the, it's world power plays right there. Two dogs fighting over the same piece of meat, trampling on Israel. And we talked about all that last week, but one, one thing I pointed out, start in verse 36, because between 35 and 36, his interest focuses, the angel's interest focuses on one particular king that rose up out of the Syrian Empire. And it turned out that this king came along in 170 years before Christ, whose name was Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, Epiphanes isn't his name, it's the title he gave himself. An Epiphany, you know what Epiphany is. A light from heaven. He called himself a light from heaven. But this man was a son of hell. He hated Israel, he hated the Jews, and he severely and seriously persecuted the Jewish faith, which is, was the only biblical faith on the earth at the time. He instituted a policy of reverse circumcision. I can't even imagine what that is. He deposed the high priest of Israel, the most important figure in the Jewish faith, uh, a representative of Christ. He took him right down, became his enemy. He replaced him with a man of his choosing, bought with a bribe, and then replaced him with another man who gave a better bribe. He profaned the word of God. He instituted homosexuality into Jerusalem, building a gymnasium. He, he persecuted anyone that would circumcise their child to the point of killing the mother, the father, the baby, and the person that actually performed the circumcision. He outlawed the Sabbath. I mean, he took on with a vengeance the complete reversal of what was biblical religion. Okay, he's a terrible man. Someone says, well, what's it? why does the angel from heaven come and show Daniel this vision and then keep this book for us to read? What's, what, what's that got to do with me? Because this guy lived uh, 170 years before Christ. Well, the connection is betw that between verse 35 and 36 is a 2,000 year plus gap. That what this man was 170 years before Christ is a foreshadowing of the last king who will rule over Israel, certainly, that we know of as the Antichrist. What was true of Antiochus Epiphanes is, in a small scale is going to become true on a worldwide scale. The kings, kings of the earth and their rulers. You know how politicians always pretend to be Christian and give lip service to the Bible when it's election time and then forget it and go about do their own thing when they're actually in office? 
even that's going by the side. The politics, kings, kings of the earth and their rulers are actually openly antichrist, openly anti-Christian now. And all they are is pointing to this ultimate expression of anti-Christianity. Verse 36 is not talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. In fact, from 36 on through the rest of this chapter, Antiochus Epiphanes, it has nothing to do with him. He's talking about right before the end, because then he goes into the resurrection. Verse 36, the king shall do according to his will. Now, we're all familiar with willful kings and leaders, right? Constitution be damned. I'm going to do what I want. He's called in Second Thessalonians the, the man of lawlessness. He'll do according to his will, and he'll exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. The worst thing, the, the epitome of what Antiochus Epiphanes did in his day, 170 years before Christ, is set up a temple, a statue of Zeus Olympius on the very burnt offering of the temple of God. He put profane and desecrated the temple, the abomination that makes desolate. But this one is going to exalt himself and magnify himself above all gods. He'll speak marvelous things against the God of gods. He'll prosper. He'll prosper until the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. This man will exalt himself. Paul quoted this in 2 Thessalonians. He said that the man of lawlessness is going to come and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped as God so that he himself sitteth in the temple and shows that he is God. Terrible thing. A world leader who calls himself God. And Paul says he's coming. He's quoting Daniel here. He's coming. A world leader that shows himself God. Well, you think about some of the world leaders today. In Germany, a nation that in some peoples that are here's lifetime became notorious for slaughtering one-third of the Jews in the whole world. You'd think they'd never go anywhere near anti-Semitism again. They just outlawed circumcision for any reason against the law, even religious reasons. You don't even have to look that far away from home. Think about our own president. You know what I said about how people always pretend to give God live service because we're still a Christian nation with a Christian ethos? How about the man that says all those people clinging to their guns and their religion and hate people that aren't like them? How about the man who announces his plans to remove a conscience clause and forces religious institutions to finance abortion. Now, whatever you think of the Catholic Church, which you know what I think of it, so I won't go there. <laughs> but how about a man who appoints pro-choice people as Vatican ambassadors? That's in your face. You see what I'm saying? That is anti-God. It's not even pretending godliness. It's anti-God. How about a man who spoke at a Catholic university but wouldn't even get in the pulpit until you covered a symbol that means Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They had to cover it with a towel before he'd stand up and speak in it. You know how in Catholic churches you see, well, some of you might not, but you see this IHS. I used to wonder, what in the world does that mean? Well, it's from the Greek, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what that means. Obama wouldn't even speak until they put a towel over that. No, Obama's not the Antichrist. And neither is Angela Merkel in Germany. But you see this Antichrist spirit more and more open. There is no more pretense. The kings of the world and their leaders are stepping out of the shadows, out into the open, to openly defy God. 
Obama began deliberately, deliberately omitting the phrase about the Creator when quoting the Declaration of Independence. He filed a post, he, filed, he filled posts in the State Department. Every one of them except the one that by law is appointed to promote religious freedom. Fifty Christians were burned in, in Nigeria last week. A Muslim baying mob surrounded the pastor's house where they went to to find refuge and they were burned alive by a group named Boko Haram. Pray for the Christians in Nigeria. Our State Department refuses to call Boko Haram a terror group. They are burning churches now. I could go on and on and on and on. New health care rules that de deny the religious conscience clause. Tying foreign aid to countries that have Christian laws against homosexuality saying you get those laws out of there or we won't give you help. Forgiving student loans if students will do public service, but the public service cannot in any way be tied to a church. <laughs> I could just go on and on, on and on. Anything Christian, openly against. See, I'm bringing that up not to be political, but to just show you, look, this is coming. This is not what we've known before. We've never known people to be openly contemptuous of God. Not in the United States. But we know it now. <laughs> I guess we got to that point where we're ready for it. God of gods, he'll say, he'll say marvelous things against the God of gods. And will prosper. He'll prosper. Someone said, how long is this going to go on? He's prospering, and all those like him will prosper. And the last one, he'll really prosper. He'll get victory after victory after victory after victory. Why? Until the indignation's over. Remember what Daniel's about. It's a long period of time in Jewish history called the indignation. Because they disobeyed, because they don't love God, because they would not believe in the Messiah, because they turned their back on God, because they uh, said, we don't have no king but Caesar. They have been under a long period of penalty and probation called by God the indignation. And these anti-God people are going to prosper until that's over. Now that's, that is going to be over. That which shall be determined shall be done. Everything we're going through right now has been determined. People go, what in the world is going on? A guy walks into a theater and shoots 70 people? A man takes a bath salt and eats someone else's face? Do you know how blessed we've been for the whole duration of your life? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. America, the beautiful, God shed his grace on thee. Do we ever think that that was just an inviolable thing? Like you could claim it, but like the Constitution, like, oh no, it's always going to be sane and orderly here. Do we really think you could turn your back on God and have it all right? Promote something like homosexual marriage, abortion? We should be thanking God we don't have more. But Cedar Rapids isn't like a zoo. It could be. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he will magnify himself above all. The king to come will not regard the God of his fathers. The gods of his fathers. The gods of his ancestors. It doesn't say the God. That's a bad translation of King James. It says the gods. He will not fear the gods of his ancestors. That doesn't mean that he's a Jew. That doesn't mean that anything other than that he's not going on the traditional line. If he's a Muslim, he's not going to fear Allah. If he's a German, he's not going to fear the Teutonic gods. If he's Greek, whatever. He's certainly not going to fear the God of the Bible. And then it says, no, the desire of women. He will not regard the desire of women. And what that's saying there, and we don't want to read into it or speculate, that this one 
is not gonna, anything that would be desirable in a relationship with a woman, this one will not pursue. This one will not be about that. Well, you can't say that he's a homosexual or anything like that. All I'm saying is that that's not what he's about. And the modern example of that is Hitler. Hitler was not about um, women. He, he got married the day that he committed suicide, so that tells you everything you need to know. He was not about women. He was about something else. He will not regard any God, for he will magnify himself above all. The picture of an arrogant leader. But in his estate, well, he won't be an atheist, though. Shall he honor the God of forces? He won't be an atheist. He's just not going to regard any God that you and I are, have ever been familiar with. You can't go back in history and see the God that he regards. This is a totally different God, totally unique God, the God of forces. Now, once again, we have modern examples of this. People like Hitler, Stalin, it was all about power. A lot of it came from the philosophies of Nietzsche and people like that. Like there is no morality, there is no good and evil, it's all power. A lot of it comes right out of evolution. The only strong survive, might makes right. His God would be power. But his God, which is power, it goes deeper than that. Because he goes on to honor it. It's not just the idea of power, not even just the philosophy. He becomes personified. He honors it with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, who he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for a gain. Okay, he goes on to talk about he will take over the strongholds by the power of this strange God. Look, this strange God that no one ever, Alexander the Great, none of these people never worship this God. It's not Mary, it's not the saints, it's not even the God of the Bible, it's not the not ball, it's like nothing else, not Allah. This strange God, the God of force and power is none less than Lucifer himself. It's Lucifer. And he acknowledges it. And he honors it. And because he does, it seems that this God, this is what verse 39 is saying, this God is the one that will give him victory after victory after victory after victory. I mean, when you take a step back and look at the big picture, it's not that simple. It's our God that allows that to happen. But it's his communion with this false God that's going to give him the victory. Hold your finger in Daniel and look at Revelation 13. A terrible, terrible test comes to the earth. Revelation 13, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and on his horns ten crowns and on his heads the name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were the feet of a bear, his mouth is the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power. The dragon, the serpent of old, the devil and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Do we not sing a song in this church to God himself? Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Who is like unto thee? The day will come, and not very long from now, when the whole world will be so enamored by this new rising political star that they will unwittingly be worshiping Satan and worshiping this star. The messianic fervor around Obama, that's just a foretaste. It's just a flashing red light. It's a warning that when people want something bad enough, the worst thing that could possibly happen to them is it should be handed to them on a silver platter. We want a Messiah. We want 
uh, a superstar, we want a savior, we want a uniter, it's coming. It's coming. Verse 5, there is given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those that dwell in heaven. Oh, yeah. We already, we already saw this. When it says he blasphemes those that dwell in heaven, it doesn't mean that he's blaspheming the current inhabitants of heaven. For in prophetic literature in the Bible, there's technical terms. Those who dwell on the earth, that means those whose horizon is this world, this life, and all that's in it. And those who dwell in heaven means those who have forsaken this world and have gone. Blaspheming those who dwell in heaven? All those bitter people clinging to their guns and their religion and hating everybody else. A regular, regular feature of our politics. Who shot up the theater? All the Tea Party people. Well, who are Tea Party people? People that still believe that you should be responsible with your finances? Mostly Christian. I'm not saying that it's a great movement or a bad movement. I don't know. I'm already in a movement. I'm waiting for the dawning of the new day. I'm just pointing out that this stuff that seemed so fantastical in 77 and 78 when I first began reading the Bible is actually happening right before our eyes. Blaspheming those who dwell in heaven? How about the Germans saying anyone that circumcises their kid is mutilating his body? Anyone that homeschools is abusing their child? Anyone who spanks a child, which by the way the Bible teaches that, is a child abuser. Oh, they blaspheme those that dwell in heaven every single day. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell on the earth. See? It's technical words. There are those who dwell on the earth and those who dwell in heaven. Where's your horizon? What do you live for? All those who dwell on the earth shall worship him. Yes, they will. Whose names aren't written in the book of life of the Lamb. Slain from the foundation of the world. Is your name written in the book of life? There's nothing as important. Go back to Daniel. This is his policy. That he'll conquer by the power of his God. He'll be given victory after victory after victory. I, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he'll really smite the Muslims a good one. People can get sick of Muslims. Maybe he'll smite them. No one will miss them. And they go, finally, someone's doing something about this. He goes on to say that he does have all kinds of wars in Africa kings of the south he has his wars he's from Europe see I believe what Daniel's teaching is that in the end the polarization in geopolitics is the developed world against the other world they want you know the developed world the civilized world against the third world. A lot has to do with Muslim, a lot has to do with Christianity, and a lot has to do indirectly with Israel. It's just like in Daniel 11. Israel's in between and everything. You know, the, uh, you know the, how close we are right now to something so, if you're a worldly, I'm speaking, catastrophic. People don't realize, but the Syria collapses and these nerve weapons of mass destruction. Remember Bush got castigated for the weapons of mass destruction? Guess what? They found them. Bush won't get any credit for it. Well, I don't care either way. But they did find them. They were in Syria. 
And Assad doesn't want to be like his buddy Gaddafi and the other Arab leaders who trusted the West as we pulled the rug right out from underneath them and turned them over to baying mobs of Muslims. So he's dispersing these weapons to use as a trump card. He's got to keep them out of the hands of the bad savages. And he's vowed, if I'm ever, my back is ever against the wall, I will use these on Israel. People, people think, well, when's Israel going to smite Iran? It's Syria first. Much more dangerous. Can you imagine nerve gas? Sarin? Yikes. We're very, very, very perilous times. Of course, I, I, I don't worry, though, because I believe in God, and I know you believe in God. I see this stuff happening, and I worry about other people, but I know that... Jesus is Lord and everything's going to happen as determined, like Daniel says. It's all going to happen like it's determined. But to see it sit here and, and un, uh, unfold. The Bible says Damascus shall be a heap of rubble. It will no longer be a city. It will be taken away from being a city. You know what Damascus' claim to fame is? The oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. That's their advertising. Isaiah 17, 1. Damascus shall be a heap. It will no longer be a city. Frightening, isn't it? Damascus shall be a heap. You could go to Damascus today, and there's still the street, straight street, where the Apostle Paul was blind for three days and then received his sight. That's still there. Remember that? Better hurry, though. Well, let me, let me move on here. He, he talks about his wars in 40 to 45. 42, he has stretched forth his hand also on the countries. The land of Egypt will not escape. Oh, 41, he'll enter also into the glorious land. Antichrist will come into the glorious land just like Antiochus did. And many countries will be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. This is interesting. Antichrist in his campaign against Egypt and against North Africa uh, plunders them and destroys them in a war, uh, which is interesting because Egypt has new, new management now. Okay. And then he comes into the Holy Land and it says all the countries around suffer his wrath except Moab, Ammon, and Edom, which the modern name for that is Jordan. Why aren't they touched? They're right there at the belly of the beast. Because the Lord is going to preserve a place for them, for the Jews to go and hide in the wilderness. Remember what Jesus said? When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then let those who are in Judea flee to the wilderness. Book of Revelation, then they went into the wilderness. The earth opened up and protected them. He says, he'll stretch forth his hand also on the countries, verse 42, the land of Egypt won't escape. Egypt has a dreadful future, although it won't be totally obliterated. Egypt will come through, and one day Egypt will be Christian itself. Because Isaiah 19 says, in that day they'll say, Blessed be Egypt, my brother, and Syria, my friend. And we will worship the Lord together. But he'll have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians should be at his steps. In those days, Ethiopia was Ethiopia, Somalia, the whole horn of Africa. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he'll plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he'll come to his end and none will help him. The tabernacle there is his military tent. He himself is in a campaign. He goes right into the holy mountain, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. He sets up his headquarters there. Other place in the Bible talks about it. And it's there that he dies. That's why we know this is an Antiochus Epiphanes. He, he died in Syria. He died differently. This man dies. And no one can help him. Now there's no chapter break. Now I want to finish this. 
At that time, shall Michael stand up. The great preach which stands for the children of thy people. Now we already talked about how behind geopolitical events, Daniel shows us there's angelic activity. At that time, Michael shall stand up. The expression stand up is a military expression. Stand up in readiness. Who is Michael the archangel? He's a good angel and he's the prince, the guardian angel of the children of Israel. And there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. There we got the book again. Is your name in the book of life? Is your name been registered there? One day books are going to be open. People are going to go, oh, God, I hope he finds my name in there. He says, Michael, stand up. And the people of Israel will be delivered. At least everyone whose name is in the book. Another one of the prophets says, two out of three won't make it. During the Holocaust, one out of three Jews in the world died. One out of three. Can you fathom one out of three of on, on any nation just being wiped out? During the Holocaust, one out of three Jews in the world died. But here he says, there's coming a time of tribulation like we've never seen before, nor will we ever see again. Jesus quoted this, by the way, in Matthew 24. Then will be great tribulation such as was never seen before on the face of the earth, nor will it ever be seen again. But your people will be delivered, he said. At least everyone that will be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This vision takes us all the way to the end, to the resurrection. The destruction of the Antichrist. The deliverance of Israel. They'll look on him whom they pierce. They'll mourn for him as for the only son. The judgment where the books are open. People's names. The resurrection of the dead. We believe in the resurrection of the dead, don't we? Many of them, well, now this is a bad translation too, because it gives you the wrong idea. What it literally says is, the many among those that sleep, the many among those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. These to everlasting life. Oh, shall awake at this time, is what it literally says. Many among those that, uh, from the dust of the earth, among those that sleep, shall awake at this time. These, is what it literally says, to everlasting life. And those, and he's talking about the rest that don't awake at this time. To shame and everlasting contempt. And I don't know why. But of all the descriptions of hell that I've ever read, from the words of Jesus, from the Proverbs, from the Psalms, from the prophets, for some reason this one is the one that is the most scary of all to me. You'll be drawn, dragged out of the grave. By the way, there's a thousand years between those two phrases. These to everlasting life. Oh God, thank you. But those to everlasting shame and contempt, perhaps the most hellish thing of all, shame and guilt and to no contempt and to be in the body. I don't know what it is about that that just goes right to the core. I don't want to go to that resurrection and I don't want anyone else to I wouldn't want anyone I wouldn't want my worst enemy I wouldn't want Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden although it looks like they might everlasting shame everlasting contempt he talks about the wise verse 3 they that be wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. See, let me connect verse 3. They that be wise. He kept talking about they that be wise when he talked about Antiochus. Those that be wise. Why? What happens? In the days of Antiochus, it's what happens at the end. A tremendous 
apostasy, a huge falling away, an incredible repudiation of the Christian faith, even among those who you would think, oh, now he'll stand, as long as he's standing, I can stand. Well, he'll stand. Well, there's a solid rock, there's a stalwart, and you sit there dumbfounded as they too participate in the apostasy. That's why I always tell you, there's a huge trial coming, a terrible test. A lot of it has to do with the apostasy. But Daniel gives us assurance, there's always a few wise ones. They have insight. They see what's going on. And they tell the people around them or whoever will listen to them, hey, that's not of God. Don't go that way. Don't bite. Don't eat that. Stay true to God even if it costs you something. Stay faithful. There's something about peer pressure that takes people away from God. But there's always going to be, God is always going to reserve to himself those that have insight is what it literally says. And they're the ones that are going to be made to look bad during the trial. They're going to be made the ones to look weak and look defeated and look like nothing. But oh, when the trial is over, like Jesus said in another place, then the righteous will shine like the sun. They'll shine like stars. They that turn many to righteousness like stars forever. Not only did they have insight, they spent their time turning other people not just to the Lord even, or not just to conversion, but to righteousness. This is not righteous. We are seeing this right now. I've told you time and again, I, I know it gets tiresome. Christian leaders promoting homosexuality, Christian leaders promoting interfaith union with other ch churches, with other religions. Softening of the stand against Islam, softening of the stand against homosexual marriage is going to dumbfound people. But there will always be some people who have insight. They may look like a stick in the mud or they may look like an idiot. They're still just standing in the way of this great, great, wonderful new world. They actually may look poverty stricken and someone that if your values are wrong, you wouldn't even give two minutes to. But when the test is over, boom, everyone will be seen in their true light. Those that turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. Now, you know, there's a lot of shooting stars that we've seen in the book of Daniel. Alexander the Great, boom, wow, look at him, gone. Antichrist himself. Boom! In his day, man, it's like, wow, that is the one. He's gone. He's in hell. Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, Adolf Hitler, Frank Sinatra. There's all kinds of stars, aren't they? Shooting stars. They shine so brightly people are in awe, but then it's just as quick. They're gone. There's another phrase in the Bible that haunts me. It's from the book of Jude. These are shooting stars for whom... The blackness of darkness is reserved forever. Oh, my friends, I don't want to be a shooting star. I want to shine like a star forever. A reflected light from my Lord, from my Jesus, from his truth. Glory and honor and splendor to everybody who remains true. But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. It's a very much misunderstood verse here. It's, it, it is true that knowledge has increased. I mean, knowledge has increased exponentially. Okay. I think I saw something like from the time of the, the vacuum tube to the time of the computer chip, the potential has multiplied in the millions of what we can do. Now, I, I'm not even technical enough to understand that, but I'll, take, I'll take, take the word for it. Okay, knowledge has increased. That's part of our problem. We know too much. I like the good old days when you, you didn't know everything outside of your purview because why do I need to hear the latest thing that this person said or that person did? But... This is not what Daniel's saying. 
He's talking about his own prophecy. Seal it up for now. For a long time, people could, could look at Daniel. They could get all kinds of good things out of it. But they could never quite know, really, because there's too many gaps. But as you get closer to the end, those gaps get filled in. Knowledge increases. When he says people go to and fro, that's true too. Travel. But that's not what he's talking about. It is incredible. I could get on a plane. Don can get on a plane. You can be on the other side of the world in two days. I remember being awed by the fax machine. Don, Bob North was in India. And we thought, well, you could send him a letter and he could get it that day. But that's not what this is talking about. When he says many shall travel to and fro, what he's saying is people are going to want to know what's going on. They're going to want some knowledge. They're going to be desperate for knowledge. And of course, that is so true. There are so many who want to know and there are so many who are into this prophecy or Nostradamus or that or what because they know something really wrong is happening. But there's a moral component. You can't just Google it. You really can't. If your heart's not faithful, you can't have understanding. If you don't love God, you may get all kinds of facts. You'll never be able to put it together. Only the righteous will understand. Anybody here? This knowledge has a moral component and makes moral demands. It's not just a uh, satisfaction of curiosity. It calls us to repent and to be earth, heaven dwellers, not earth dwellers. To look and wait and long for the appearing of our Lord. And to turn many to righteousness. That's why they will run to and fro. They'll come back empty in a lot of cases. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was on the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? The question is, how long? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was on the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swore by him that lives forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, times and a half. And when he will have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all those things will be finished. Now this is important. He sees three angels. And one says to the other, how long? And the other Usually when you take an oath in the Bible, you lift up one hand. The other, he lifts up both hands to emphasize the solemnity of it. He swears by God. He wants us to know. It's only going to be three and a half years. It's only going to be three and a half years. What's only going to be three and a half years? The verse, first, first, then shall be great tribulation such as the world has never seen before, nor will it ever see again. Three and a half years. Three and a half years is like a year. How long, Lord? And the answer is two more years. Oh, God, I don't think I can take it. Okay, then the answer is a half year. Cut off. Suddenly. Three and a half years. He swears by it. And then he gives us an insight. I'm sorry I'm so, taking so long, but let me, let me finish this. Then he gives us an insight. Why is there going to be a tribulation? What is the real purpose of the tribulation? He wants to shatter the power of the holy people. He wants to shatter the power of the holy people. See, I remember... When I first became a Christian, I thought, wow, the Six-Day War. Look at the IDF, man. They came through. They saved Israel. They smashed seven Arab countries, and they did. And the Arabs are still humiliated to this day. The Muslim world just can't stand the fact that they were humiliated by a little tiny postage stamp country. And then Israel got nuclear, and then Israel got powerful, and Israel's got powerful friends. The United States and all the other allies of Europe used to support them. And Israel was the regional superpower and the second strongest uh, army in the world. You think, wow, this is great. No, it's supposed to go the other way. So that's what's happening now. All Israel's friends are taken away, including us. The IDF is so hamstrung 
by the UN and the US and the European Union that they even lose against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. The first war was preemptive strike and that just enraged the Arabs. Ever since then, everything is tied with give up, go back to the 67 borders, be weakened. 1974, they were almost wiped out. Richard Nixon got a phone call from Golda Meir. She said, you got to help us because they were getting their tank parts and their plane parts from France and France said nope because they wanted to please the Arabs. And Golda Meir begged for help and Nixon said, when I was a boy, I was Quaker, my mother read the Bible to me and one day she said, if you ever have a chance to help the Jews, Richard, do it. So he said, of course I'll help because of that airlift. They were almost wiped out. Isn't that a great story? Isn't that better than Watergate? <laughs> no wonder the devil hated him. Look, in the end, the whole thing is to get that, their power broken. Not their military power, not their physical power. Really, this is about their stubborn will. Let me say something about Israel. It's a microcosm of the whole human race. Is Israel stubborn? You better believe it's stubborn. They do not want to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They set themselves, they dig their heels, and they will not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And they will not repent and turn to God. They, they'll even reformulate the Bible, they'll reformulate their feasts. The rabbis are the biggest deceivers you've ever seen in your life, how they lie about passages of Scripture. They have no fear of God. They are stubborn. And the tribulation is designed to bring them to the end of themselves. Like Jesus said, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know what's happening in the world today? Everything that's happening, Syria, the whole thing, Russia, China, the Muslim world, the so-called Arab Spring, which is really a nightmare. You know what all this is designed to do? Shatter the power, the willpower, the power of their unbelief, so that they can bring God can bring about a national regeneration. God would bring them to repentance. And the last three and a half years are unbelievable. Personally, I believe in the rapture. I look for the Savior. Someone says, "Are you pre, post, or mid?" Um, I used to be pre, but I'm, not, I'm hedging my bets. I want to be ready for everything. It's looking mid. Hope it's not post. I'm so paranoid about it, I won't eat post toasties. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 8, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, Oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel. The words are closed up and sealed till the end of time, the time of the end. Many will be purified and made white and tried. Oh yeah, that purification though, that's a fire. Many will be purified, made white and tried. But the wicked will do wickedly. See, this is another thing he points out, the, the trajectory of wickedness and righteousness. Paul said in the New Testament, the evil men will wax worse and worse. Many will be tried and become whiter. Some people are going this way. They may have been really bad that they started here, but they're moving this way. God's giving, putting them through trials. God's purifying them. Horrible things have happened, but they find all things work together for good. They're coming closer to God. Other people, they may have started way over here on the right wing. They're just so upright, such good citizens, but they are going the other way. I don't ever remember people eating people's faces in American cities. Nor do I remember masses of young people coming into grocery stores and gas stations and just pillaging with no fear of law whatsoever or beating people or people showing up at Batman and by the way the thing about that 
That is not a crazy man, because that took a lot of calculation. Oh, someone said, what is he? I have no idea. I would say he's probably possessed, but he's not crazy. This is not some rash guy that lost his temper one day and just blew up. This took weeks of meticulous calculation. All of our beautiful cities and beautiful, beautiful lifestyle compared to the third world like Don and some of the others have seen, all that was always a blessing. If that gets taken away, it's chaos. Now let me just close here. From the time that the daily sacrifice should be taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there will be 1,290 days. Three and a half years plus 30 days. So evidently, 30 days before the Great Tribulation begins, they take away the right of sacrifice. That means the temple will be built again. And yet, daily sacrifice will be taken away. Okay. So, 1,290 days, but then he goes, Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,335 days. So another 45 days. Blessed is the one that makes it to then. What's he saying? Now look, I don't know exactly, and I'm not here to speculate. I have the feeling that after Jesus comes back, there's a lot of things are going to be sorted out. There's going to be judgments that take place that some people won't make it through. There will be unsaved people that will go into the millennium. There will. But not all of them. He's saying, look, if you make it through all that stuff. See, what I think it is, is 1,335 days. Is That's when the inauguration of the kingdom of God takes place. And he says, blessed are you if you're still there. After the books are wrote, written, nations are judged. It's really something. But go thy way till the end. Till the end, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. My Lord, I've said many things today. But like I was saying, and I believe I was saying it by your spirit. Not just vanities. Not just because it's interesting. Are curious. This is a revelation from heaven. And I pray that I'll always treat these revelations right. And you're calling people to repentance and to no longer be earth dwellers, but heaven dwellers. And you're calling people to get ready and make a clean break with all their sins, to be reconciled to you and to anyone else that they hate. You're calling people to wake up and not be that frog in the pot that wakes up too late, he's boiling and he's dead. Oh God, sharpen us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Call us to you over and over and over again. One of your most blessed promises is, I will never leave you or forsake you. Oh God, we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.